Our guest today, uh, Raphael Wierkowski, Executive Chairman of Medically Home. Dr. Steve Perotti, Executive Vice President, the Permanente Federation. Dr. John Halamka, President of Mayo Clinic Platform. Um, and the three of them will offer some opening remarks and then we will go to Q&A after that. We are also joined by Dr. Margaret Paulson. She is the Chief Clinical Officer for Advanced Care at Home um, in our Mayo Clinic Health System in the Northwest Wisconsin region. So thank you everybody to our participants and journalists for joining us. So Raphael, um, you're gonna start us off today giving us some of the history of Medically Home and the vision of this announcement, and then you will turn it over to Dr. Perotti. So go ahead and get started. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, everyone. And uh, this is a very, very special uh, day in my life, professional and personal. And uh, it's about a 13 year journey that I'm gonna try to condense in two minutes of history. Mm -hmm. um, so a long time ago, uh, I was joining the board of an academic medical center where my dad was coincidentally admitted as a patient. And then he subsequently lost his life to medical errors while I was watching, which begged the question, since I was affiliated with that, that health system, you know, how did this happen? It, it led to a journey uh, discovering that a very significant part of the expenses associated with hospitalization is fixed costs overhead, roughly 65% and most institutions a little higher and others, which left only 35% of the reimbursement for healthcare in, in a hospital to actually provide clinical care to patients, which led to a question, what if we move that patient to another side of care where the overhead costs were much lower? And that led obviously to the question of, is it possible to deliver this type of care in a home? Uh, at that time, I had already had a 10 year relationship with Johns Hopkins Medicine and Bruce Leff was a physician, the, the eminent researcher around hospital care at home, particularly the benefits of hospitalizing acutely ill patients at home. And I met and I asked him the question, if we, if we developed the point of view of moving patients to the home, what are the biggest challenges? And at that point, I didn't even realize there was 15 years of experience around the world, Australia, Western Europe, and other locations delivering hospital care at home. However, at very low acuity. Um, and because of that, it was a very significant limitation of how many patients you could actually move from a health system to a home. And he said the key issue was logistics to decentralize care that has been, you know, for over a century centralized. That was the key question. Myself and my colleagues at the time were engineers and physicians. And we asked the question, how could we move this high acuity care currently domiciled in a hospital to the home? Um, that led to a whole series of of meetings across the, the country with health system leaders, some of them my friends and colleagues. And about four years ago, we launched this model, which I'll describe in a moment, in Boston um, with the Atrius Health System for a very serious and complex patient named Chuck. And Chuck became our, our, our true, our poster child around what's possible and what we needed to be aware of for caring for patients in a home setting, mostly the unique complications that patients have with social determinants, family matters, and other things that are really directly related to healthcare, but not necessarily treated in the traditional hospital setting. Chuck and the results of Chuck then led to a relationship with MGH in Boston. And we started doing oncology care for uh, clinical trial patients, which was a really interesting development. All around that time, um, Mayo Clinic and Kaiser Permanente had already been exploring this idea of caring for patients and providing advanced care at home. And we met. And Steve and I actually met at a, at a hospital home conference in, in Madrid. Uh, and there was, they were giving a speech about a hospital home at the same time that we were. And that's how we became acquainted. So through the course of this very, very rapid relationship, we started to develop a strategy of how we would do this together. However, COVID hit. And when COVID hit, the gaps, particularly the strong gaps around balancing supply and demand became apparent and the need to create more capacity for the US health system also became apparent. And all of a sudden, medically home became relevant. Uh, but the difference between what we're trying to do and what had been historically part of the home hospital idea was focusing on serious and complex care. So today we've scaled and the history of the company, I think we'll cover probably Q&A, but the, the history was, it began with a very personal matter for me. 
and it became uh, an enterprise and it's still a very strong personal mission for me personally, as well as my family to try to provide the best care for patients in the setting they prefer, which, which in many cases is the home, which then leads to kind of the vision. Um, the, the idea of organizing around the patient, the family and the home versus the historical organization around the provider and the payer is a real transformation. And to really do that, you have to convert and transform the way care is delivered, particularly in the community, meaning you have to develop the skill sets, the capabilities and the systems that we've relied upon in a central hospital. When a physician writes an order, they can reliably expect that it will be delivered to actually create that reliability in a community is a major challenge. And that's been the effort and the real vision behind what we're trying to do. But the heart of this announcement is that we believe together, Kaiser Mayo, Medically Home, that it's time for a provider-led transformation of healthcare delivery. And others have tried to transform healthcare, the Amazons of the world, the, the others in the world who come from the outside um, have, not, have not been successful. And we believe that the right approach to actually provide the transformation that everyone is recognizing is needed, needs to come from within. And we believe that the two partners that we've come together with, there's no one better in the world to actually provide that provider-led central uh, decentralization of care. The only other things I'll share before I turn it over to Steve is, um, the, the, the market, if you will, if you look at it that way, um, can be divided into like lower acuity care at home, which represents from five to 10% of patients currently hospitalized to this more serious and complex patient cohort, which represents about 30% of the hospitalization. So our goal to scale and make this model available to as many patients around the country and frankly around the world is to focus on the serious and complex patients because that's where the scale is and that's where the opportunity to really impact people is the most. So serious and complex care, um, try to reach 30% of the patients around the country and around the world. And the last thing I'll say is that in my heart, and it always has been there, this need to really focus on underserved patients, particularly in underserved communities, rural America, rural globally is another area that we're very, very interested in, focused on and the opportunity and the ability to now do that in the current environment that we have in the country around focusing on health equity, it's another tailwind that has joined the COVID tailwind that really drove the history of, of Medically Home. So I'm really, really privileged to be here today with, with, with John and Steve Mayo and Kaiser. This is an amazing coming together of, of, of clinical leaders on behalf of patient care and patient care transformation. So Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Raphael. And uh, first of all, good morning to everyone and thank you for joining us today. Kaiser Permanente is making this investment in Medically Home because we see this as an investment in the future. The person-centered approach to providing high acuity and quality care in the comfort of a patient's home has emerged from the learnings before and during this pandemic. I mean, never has it been as there as it is now to ensure that healthcare is focused on the entire patient, where we are able to address both the medical and social determinants that have led to a patient's condition so that we can prevent hospitalizations altogether and address a person's true goals of care. We believe that this technology enabled platform will extend the reach and expertise of our hospital teams and provide the opportunity for new members of the team to visualize the reality of a patient's home through true community level care that's inclusive of, inclusive of home nurses, physician assistants, and community paramedics. With the growing number of people who are aging uh, over the age of 65, we need to discover and implement programs that will address the needs of this population at a scale that has never been seen in the United States. Kaiser Permanente firmly believes that providing this type of care in the comfort of a person's home is also a way to improve access, whether it is in an underserved or rural setting. This program builds upon a trend that we've been seeing in healthcare over the course of the last decade, where care is really driven to the patient's home, as opposed to the patient having to come to the healthcare system. So in summary, this is a patient-centered program that really exemplifies the mission of Kaiser Permanente, which is to drive and provide high quality and affordable care 
to those who need it, desire it, and require it. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Halamka, uh, with the Mayo Clinic. Great. Well, thanks so much, Raphael and Stephen. So if I were to ask the two of you, what was the most impactful thing that happened during COVID? And I will tell you, it isn't telemedicine and it isn't regulatory change, it's collaboration. We have all learned to work together in ways that I would even consider not traditional collaboration. Kaiser and Mayo Clinic coming together with Medically Home to change the way that acute care is delivered in this country is an amazing event to be celebrated. Our experience with Medically Home has been that we've been able to achieve the same quality, the same safety, the same outcomes, but very significantly higher patient and family satisfaction. And why? I mean, it's for the reasons you've heard from Raphael and Stephen. We are forced as we enter a home to assess the whole patient, the whole family, and social determinants of health. You understand what are their support systems? How do we bring the whole family back to wellness? And here's a case for you. We had an elderly patient with a very significantly low sodium. This would typically require a bricks and mortar hospitalization. That patient's spouse was a cancer patient. What we discovered entering the home is we had to feed the family, not just care for the patient. So we were able to achieve bringing the entire family back to wellness by bringing them support and taking into account not only their medical needs, but their social needs. We've also found reduction in readmission rates. We've had patients, especially the elderly patients, feel so much more secure and comfortable in their own homes. So when the 300 plus patients that we've discharged from our command center in Jacksonville, Florida, working in Florida and Wisconsin, I would say our success has been extraordinary. The patients have been very satisfied and complications have been extraordinarily low. That is, there has not been unexpected morbidity or mortality in any way, proving the model of medically home can scale nationwide. What's also happened during COVID, in addition to these collaborations we've talked about, is cultural change. My mom is nearly 80, and my father passed away seven years ago. Do you know that before COVID, my mother did not communicate digitally? And it's now her experience. Oh, you mean if I have to get safe quality care, I have to learn to use a digital device and, oh, okay, you know, it's working fine. Uh, I'm pretty happy with that. So we now have a new cultural expectation of delivering care of all kinds at a distance. And so the timing of announcing this collaboration of Kaiser and Mayo and Medically Home couldn't be better because the culture is ready to accept it. And the final thing I'll mention about COVID is we've seen a radical change in regulatory frameworks and reimbursement during this COVID period. I am an emergency physician. It's a little bit peculiar, but I am the nation's expert on poisonous mushrooms and plants, and I do 900 teleconsultations a year. Before COVID, let's imagine a young child in North Dakota had eaten a mushroom. A physician in North Dakota who's licensed in North Dakota would have to call me, I would offer advice, and then the physician in North Dakota would deliver the treatment. Well, now that we have regulatory relaxation and waivers, this idea that you can use telemedicine to bring the best experts to the patient in the right place at the right time at the right level of acuity with reimbursement that is near parity to traditional bricks and mortar care empowers these new models that we're discussing with you today. So although the pandemic has been a tragedy, it has built collaborations that are extraordinary, patient experiences that are culturally appropriate, and regulatory frameworks that will make it sustainable. So truly, as I told my wife this morning, Raphael, this is the most exciting day of my career. Thank Turn it back to Tracy. Thank you. Thanks, all of you. Um, 
I will, before we open it up generally to question and answers, and um, you can do, you can ask your questions either in the chat or you can just take yourself off mute. Um, but Dr. Paulson, I did wanna um, see if you could fill a gap for us. Um, and if you can, uh, well, you can please talk about um, Mayo Clinic's experience over the last year with Medically Home, but maybe describing the process um, that happens with the patient and what the command center looks like and maybe how this is, this is different and how you see that work. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Um, so when John Rico Ferruja was thinking about how patients wanted to be treated in the year 2030, um, hospital at home really rose to the top as, as something that he wanted to prioritize. And for all the reasons uh, that Dr. Halamka and uh, Dr. Prodi and Raphael had talked about, patients want personalized experiences. Um, so when we partnered with Medically Home, we saw this as, as a new way of doing hospital at home. Many of the hospital at home models have been built on the concept of putting doctors and nurses in cars, traveling to patients' homes. The way that this model is different and the way that we can care for patients here where I'm sitting in Wisconsin with the physician and command center in Florida is that the physician visits are virtual. So um, when patients are being considered for this model, um, they are uh, organized uh, based on a few different uh, criteria. So uh, we have our command center in Florida. We have a hub here in Northwest Wisconsin based out of Eau Claire. And the doctors and nurses in Florida organize and care for the patients virtually. There are teams in the field who um, bring the needed services to patients in their homes. At our two very different uh, hospitals, Mayo Clinic Florida, which is a destination medical center with strong uh, expertise in transplant and oncologic care. Um, we also have Eau Claire, Wisconsin, um, part of the Mayo Clinic health system. So it's a community health system. It's a rural environment. Um, we have uh, patients in our acute hospitals. Uh, we have a main hospital in Eau Claire with four uh, critical access hospitals. Um, feeding into that system. So we do acute care and post-acute care here. So when patients are being considered for the model, they're presenting at either one of those uh, different locations. And patients can come into the model either from the emergency department or from uh, within the hospital itself. Uh, patients uh, need to be within 30 miles of those locations because we want to have that uh, safety net of the hospital with a response system uh, going to the home. Um, and we assess them. We assess, are they clinically appropriate? There's, there's some patients who just aren't appropriate for the model. Um, certainly ICU patients um, aren't appropriate. Patients who need uh, surgical procedures uh, who need to be in the hospital. Um, but there are a vast majority of patients who, who can be safely treated for the home, for in the home. So we assess them clinically. We also do a social stability screen. So we talk with the patients and talk with their families to make sure that their home really is um, an environment that can support their uh, treatment and recovery um, and is also safe, safe for our staff to go into. So, um, Patients at either one of those locations can come into the model. They're cared for by the physician in the command center in Florida um, with people going into the home locally um, and care is coordinated out of that command center and, and um, patients have access to their doctors and nurses 24 seven with a, with a touch of the uh, iPad that's in their home. Uh, so that technology that uh, medically home has developed really uh, lends itself to treating these high acuity patients in the home. Thank you, Dr. Paulson. All right, I am going to open it up to questions. I did have um, one in a message just to me, so I'll open it up with that one. 
um, first. And then Paul, I see you have a couple of questions. You can just take yourself off mute after we answer this one, if you would like. Uh, so this question, and this is kind of for all four of you, maybe the first question is for you, Raphael. I'll read the two questions and then maybe you can start, Raphael. What needs to happen to enable you to treat a greater share of serious or complex patients in the home setting? And then the second part of the question that could be for Dr. Perotti, Halamka, or Dr. Paulson, um, how might aspects of Mayo or Kaiser Permanente's clinical models allow you to do so? Yes, yeah, so the uh, two, two, two components to the answer to the first question. The first is, is underway, which is regulatory support for the model, uh, which be, has begun with the Hospital Without Walls waiver from CMS, which creates confidence, not just around the reimbursement opportunity for providers of the model, but importantly, it sends a signal to clinicians that if CMS is endorsing this and they've done the diligence, it has a, a layer of safety that's assumed. So reimbursement, uh, continued reimbursement support, Tracy, would be the first part. The second part, which is not very well known, and why the partnership with, with Bayo and, and Kaiser Permanente has been so critical to, to us. When a clinician, a, a, an established clinician is treating a patient in a hospital setting, their level of confidence when they write a medical order is high that it'll be it'll be carried out reliably inside of the four walls of a hospital. When they write an order and that order has to be implemented inside of the community, the level of confidence not not unexpectedly has to have a, 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 a tinge of uncertainty given the, the lack of history, lack of a, of, a, of a century of experience using the hospital as a go-to Ex, you know, implementation arm of a medical order. So the second thing that has to happen is that serious and complex care has to become a common practice of clinical care delivery. Going from low to high is difficult in terms of acuity, starting with serious and complex care, and then getting confidence in the clinical community about the model, particularly its reliability and its safety, is the most important thing from our standpoint, which is why we were very careful to pick the partners we did. So two answers, continued regulatory support and focus on serious and complex patients to allow the model to be embraced by the physicians that will be attending uh, for patient care going forward. Okay, thank you. And then um, open it up for Dr. Perotti, Halamka and um, Paulson for that question about um, what makes our clinical models, um, you know, a good, a good um, partner to do this with medically home? What, what about our models that make this a good fit? So uh, thank you for the question. So when I think about uh, the journey we've been on when it comes to hospital care over the past decade, um, Kaiser Permanente has had multiple programs um, to facilitate actually shorter length of stay, improved clinical outcomes. Um, those are, of course, reflected in the, the Medicare STARS measures and you know, other uh, national measures in terms of our commitment to both quality and safety. Um, and over the last really five to seven years, we've focused on um, new techniques for being able to either discharge patients or actually avoid hospitalization altogether. You know, probably one of the biggest um, opportunities that we saw was being able to change our surgical techniques um, and being able to now take care of the majority of people that are coming in for a hip replacement or a knee replacement, uh, no longer needing hospitalization, being able to provide the services um, post-surgery in the home. Um, so we kind of saw the opportunity here to then take those techniques and say, can we do that for a larger medical population. The medical population that's uh, really populating the majority of a regular hospital ward. Um, and so this platform, which uh, Raphael referenced, uh, that deals with not only the, the clinical care, but you know, as importantly here, the logistics of getting the materials um, into the home is critical. Um, and it's also critical um, just as we've had to do in transforming surgical care, it's got to move at the speed of care. That really means that if a doctor is ordering something like oxygen, that it's delivered 
really at the same level that that person's going to need that oxygen delivered into that home. Um, so we're not talking about your standard home health service where you order something and something happens in a day. Um, we're talking about it needs to happen within a matter of hours. Um, and, and really, it's a bundling of multiple orders that needs to occur. Um, so this fits into actually our, our care model um, and, and really is now an extension of uh, what we had done with other populations. Um, and it fits in with actually the whole sort of mission of Kaiser Permanente. I think this also fits into the mission of Mayo in, in my conversations uh, with our partners here um, that we're really uh, going after at the end of the day, um, superior and excellent patient outcomes. And so why does it fit in the model? When I joined Mayo Clinic, 17 months ago. The first time I was presented the values of Mayo Clinic, the primary value is the needs of the patient come first. And if we were telling a patient, you can achieve that same level of care and wellness from the comfort and safety of your own home, that is truly one of the most patient-centric things we can do. So absolutely benefits the patients. But what about providers? If they have specialty knowledge, Today, the providers at Mayo Clinic, of course, in Rochester and Jacksonville, Scottsdale and our community health system and our affiliates. But what if there's a patient and family that need that specialty knowledge and can't travel and they aren't proximate to any one of the destinations? Well, this is a way in which Mayo can extend its model of specialty care, high quality, serious and complex care, not only nationally, but internationally. And then I'll also reflect on Mayo's education research mission, because education can, as we describe these next generation of caregivers that'll come into the home, community paramedics, for example, we can all have a role in training and upskilling a next generation of caregivers across this country. And we can study how these changes in care delivery impact quality and safety and outcomes. So truly, I think it is a perfect alignment to all of our shields and our values. Tracy, I think you're on mute. And I was just asking you if you had anything else to add. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I guess the thing I would add is that uh, this has been, I think it, it lends itself to what Dr. Lamko was talking about. The needs of the patient come first. And our, our organization is known for uh, strong specialty care. And this type of care doesn't happen in a silo. It's not just one type of doctor caring for these patients. If a patient needs a subspecialty consultation in the home, our colleagues have been collaborating with us to make that possible. So collaboration, as we talked about earlier, and that team-based care really is uh, essential to putting the needs of the patients and making this uh, model available to patients with complex, serious illnesses. Excellent, thank you. Hopefully that answered that question or those questions. Um, Paul Scott from Rochester Post Bulletin Forum Communications. Paul, do you want to take yourself off mute and ask yourself the question or let me know if you prefer I do sure, it? Sure, that's fine. Thanks, everyone. Um, I just had a couple, so I'll just throw them out here. I'm just wondering if the uh, patient satisfaction data that you mentioned earlier, if that's published somewhere that we can reference um, and maybe they can send me that afterwards, but I guess I'm hoping you can address uh, what, um, how the Mayo and Kaiser partnership came about and what uh, this uh, partnership uh, adds to the capacity that was announced last summer with the Mayo Medically Home Partnership. Well, on the first point, we'll make the, uh, the data available to you. The headline that's worthy of of mentioning is that across the board where this model has been used, the patient satisfaction levels on average are significantly higher than those in a brick and mortar hospital. But that's not surprising. All the research through the years providing kind of the comfort and safety and familiarity of a home 
not surprisingly, uh, creates higher levels of satisfaction, but we'll get you that data. In terms of the, the, the value and or the vision of both Kaiser and Mayo coming together, I'll just speak through my lens. Um, when I met, when I met uh, Mayo Clinic for the first time, I went to Rochester to do a tour. My, my mom was a patient there in 1980, and that left an impression on me. And, and obviously the later impression that visiting them on behalf of the strategy was very, very meaningful to me. And then I met Steve in Madrid, as I mentioned earlier, where, where, where Kaiser has gone at a, at a scale larger than anyone else is the recognition that sustained, to sustain the health system, you have to have real value. It's not just great clinical care, it's great clinical care that's affordable, not just down to the individual or whatever payer, it's down to the economy. So their scale and their recognition of value has always been deeply uh, impressive to me. Bringing, bringing Mayo and their knowledge, their medical knowledge and their 150 year history of serious and complex care with the quality of care, the, the scale and the values of the value of healthcare that Kaiser brings, it's just an unprecedented collaboration. So my dream was to get the two of them on the phone together, which took three months. Um, and I was actually moving my kayak that day when we got everybody on the phone together. And, and just listening to, to the conversations between these two organizations and their values being shared was a dream that we had that's come together. And, and since the collaboration has begun, the scaling of Medically Home will happen, not, not just because of the collaboration, clinical resources, number of patients, capital, but the values that each of these organizations bring to help other systems feel confident to move forward and bring this to their patients. That's the real idea behind this is the confidence that the other health systems have now recognized because of these two systems coming together. And Raphael, I would make it even more personal, uh, which is, is that I've worked uh, with Kaiser for decades. In fact, I was a Kaiser Northern California and Kaiser Southern California member. And my daughter, who's now 28, was born in Kaiser Santa Rosa. So the synergy between the organizations, each of them has their own skills and expertise, but together their knowledge of the supply chain and the regulatory framework and care delivery models in non-traditional settings is truly world-class. And as you say, by the coming together of a Kaiser and a Mayo, each of which are slightly different organizations, different histories, what we do is we signal the industry saying, aha, this idea of the hospital of the future, here's my prediction, an emergency department and OR some ICU beds and pretty much the rest of it will be done in non-traditional settings. That's my prediction. So I'll, I'll just add um, one or a couple of points to this. Uh, one is that um, we see tremendous opportunity to scale this model together. Um, we have different footprints in the country um, we have different types of populations. Um, we think this model needs to be pressure tested uh, amongst those different populations and different locales uh, in the United States. Um, I, I also see tremendous opportunity for our teams to exchange uh, with each other, our experiences. Um, and you really, um, I think this is a you know, groundbreaking moment for Mayo and Kaiser Permanente uh, to come together, share our collective expertise um, both as uh, John and Raphael were talking about at the, you know, regulatory and business level, but uh, also at, at a very deep sort of clinical level um, that has not been present in the past. I'm very excited about that. If I can ask a quick follow-up, um, there's been a, a bed building boom here in Rochester. Does a, a venture that um, affects 30% of hospitalized patients um, affect the uh, capacity for housing people in hospitals? So my experience, and please, you know, uh, Raphael, Stephen, Tracy, add your own thoughts. What it means is that we're going to see different kinds of patients in our bricks and mortar facilities. You heard that, well, there are certain kinds of patients who are sick but stable. And that works really well in non-traditional settings. Now, when I talk to my leadership affiliates at all the Mayo sites, they say, you know, sometimes we are really resource constrained. We actually can't see all the patients who need our care. Well, what if we take those proportion 
that can get safe quality care at a distance and then open up those beds for those who cannot have a hospital at home experience. We're serving more patients and achieving the best outcome with the right intensity of care in the right place. Amer America's, uh, America's people continue to grow in population size. And as everyone knows, the, the segment of us, including me, that are aging and increasing the percentage of patients that are gonna require advanced care is growing. So there's gonna be a, a need for hospital level care and advanced hospital level care grow at least through the next two decades. And that's well acknowledged. The real question is, do you add that capability with two to $4 million a bed of capacity, or do you create more flexible capacity to add to the existing capacity? That's the question. And what COVID really taught us is you probably need a combination of adding more flexible capacity and to John's point, really recognizing what's the appropriate use of a bricks and mortar facility and how it interacts. But the best way to think of this, these patients' homes is another ward, another floor of the hospital at the disposal of health systems to flex up and flex down as they need. Because in the future, we're probably gonna need that, not just for population growth, but for the, the eventual needs of what we learned during this pandemic, which is we have to be able to rapidly respond with additional capacity on demand. Yeah, my, my um, contribution to this question is that uh, we are essentially right-sizing for the future. Um, when I think about uh, the 12.8 million patients that we're responsible for uh, across this country, um, and when I talk about this program, uh, with Kaiser Permanente physicians, as well as other clinicians. Um, I, I want to open their eyes to the idea that we have the ability to have hospital capacity here and now. It's actually another 12.8 million beds beyond the beds that we have within our brick and mortar facilities. Um, it is our charge, it is our duty uh, to figure out who those patients are, select the right ones, um, and Again, it, it is not just a complete replacement. I, I see this as an extension of really our ability to actually see into our patients' lives. I'm going to tell you one story. It's the story of the red truck. Um, we had a, a patient who came in highly skeptical of um, hospitalization, period, um, actually de declined hospitalization in our brick and mortar facility, uh, but also was declining the, this program. Um, he clearly needed hospital level care. And so after a couple of interactions with our hospital at home team, um, he actually accepted the, um, the help. And so we ended up going into his home. Um, and let me just put it this way. He was a tough customer. Uh, but after about a day or two, what we were able to do is assess his home and actually understand some of his reluctance to actually engaging with the healthcare team. Um, and we were actually able to address his ultimate goal of care because um, we actually got to that. There was a red truck in his driveway that was brand new that he had just bought. Um, and he was dealing with a particular issue that affected his leg. Um, and he was deathly worried that he wasn't going to be able to drive that red truck. Um, so everything then focused on how we were going to get him into that red truck. Um, and that completely resonated with him. Uh, and the reason I tell you that story is that uh, we weren't doing it in the abstract. The team was actually visualizing what that patient's needs were. Um, and we were able to look at his refrigerator um, and some of what he was eating was contributing to his medical condition. Um, so we, it was a holistic approach that you simply can't get unless you're actually bringing the care into the person's home. What a great story. Um, I know we have a question from Diane um, from McKnight's Home Care, home care that I want to get to, but one thing that, um, I, and any of you can address this, um, maybe it's best for you, Raphael, but um, we're talking a lot about Mayo and Kaiser Permanente here. So the vision is to expand this and to scale this to others. Can you talk a little bit about that, the, the broad big plan? Yeah, well, the, the first plan was to uh, demonstrate that the, that the program was in the best interest of all of the key stakeholder, stakeholders, which obviously begins with the patient and the family, then providers, 
then payers and obviously regulators to enable all this to come together. The broad plan was to not assume that this model would go any faster than it, it, it needed to go. And then here came COVID and now health equity. I never planned on a pandemic and I certainly never, never planned on the current administration, given all the history we've all had over the, we shared together as a country and everyone on the Zoom call. I never planned on either of those. And I made a lot of jokes that every plan that I had didn't work, but the one plan that didn't work that worked the best was COVID and, and the shift in consciousness in our country around equity. So uh, our plan is to, is to drive very, very hard and to have both Kaiser Mayo and our other customers utilize the model across multiple use cases. And, and again, not to, to use terminology that is not really, really easy to digest, the, the, the capability we're building together with Kaiser and Mayo, think of it as a platform, no different than when he originally built a hospital to do you know, surgery, then we started to do other kinds of models inside of the physical hospital. In the same way, we've built a, a hospital platform that can do oncology care, NICU care, uh, longitudinal care, we can do emergency care. We're doing many of those things today. So the first plan is to get as many use cases as, as feasible and safe inside of our existing customer base and to demonstrate the impact that the model has on patient quality, patient satisfaction, and economics. The second is to, is to bring the coalition of the willing who follow the coalition of the leaders to the party. And I've had 113 conversation since we made the original um, Mayo announcement with health systems, both in the US and abroad. And, and they're watching very, very carefully how others use the model. Uh, and I think 138-ish, uh, Tracy, a health system have applied for the waiver, the hospital owns waiver with CMS, which is another signal. So our plan is to take the existing customers to increase use case around the platform, and then to be responsive to inbound interest in the model and to help them bring them along both here and abroad. But the other thing I should mention, which is again, a passion and why I'm here in Oklahoma today is we have a very strong interest in underserved patients, particularly rural underserved patients. And another plan is to take the model and ensure that it has the capability and capacity to safely reach and provide care access to, to rural, rural Americans. But all of that means high growth and uh, expansion uh, but careful expansion, always keeping patient safety ahead of anything else for the reasons you, I'm sure, appreciate given the history of the company. I want to say one more thing. I, I guess I've never had a chance to say this until now. This is a company, Medically Home, and, and if you talk to my colleagues, and we've had the good fortune of bringing in strategic investors, we've never gone after traditional you know, financial or institutional capital because this is a very not-for-profit type of vision of serving patient needs and social good and social impact. We are in, this, in the structure and by bringing Kaiser and Mayo in the way we are, we've also repositioned how we're perceived both in the marketplace around the world and also in a regulatory, in a regulatory way. So the other value of the Mayo-Kaiser partnership is it repositions medically home in the primary service of care for patients above and above and beyond anything else. And just to Thank amplify you. what Rob Mayo said, so I serve as president of Mayo Clinic Platform. And you, of course, may say, well, what's a platform? To, you know, you've already used that point, Raphael. It's a series of components, technology and services that enable Mayo to not just serve Mayo, but to serve healthcare throughout the world. So in fact, it's the very mission of what I do to take the capabilities we're talking about today and to spread them far and wide beyond just Mayo and Kaiser. And as Raphael knows, we are having international discussions, asking how we can take this technology and specialty expertise and spread it across the planet. Thank you. And that, um, and I know we're running up against time a little bit here, but I do want to make sure we get those last couple questions answered. And you're kind of leading into them with your um, last bit of information there. So. Um, both Diane um, from um, McKnight's and then um, I think it was Chris Novak from Star Tribune asked about the investment. So um, the detail of the investment, I can give that. And then I'm hoping um, Raphael and um, Drs. Perotti and Dr. Halamka, if you can add what you'd like 
Um, if you can see Christopher's extra questions in there, I can read them too. But um, Mayo and Kaiser Permanente are investing approximately 100 million combined. So that's the, that's the detail piece, um, but hoping the rest of you can um, answer some of the other questions in Christopher Snowbeck's question. Can you see that? I can quickly answer the, uh, the number of employees in the medical field. We are a private company, as I mentioned, and we are, um, we are, we are gearing up. Uh, when I was CEO of the company, when I left that role a year ago, we had 30 employees. I believe we have 167 today and growing rapidly. We have operating centers around the country in different regions and, and pretty soon internationally. So the capital will enable a rapid expansion of making this model available to patients around the United States and obviously around the world. But I wanna really emphasize this is not a financial transaction. This is an enablement of a model that's been embraced by clinical leaders on behalf of patient care. And, um, and the capital, again, to the precise question, the capital is being used to expand access to the model. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll second that. You know, the, the investment we're making is so that we can size and scale this um, to the needs of the populations that, of course, we care for, you know, Kaiser Permanente is actually walking the walk. Um, we have uh, a, a program where now we've enrolled more than 500 uh, patients into the program. Um, and so, you know, we of course want to scale it within Kaiser Permanente, but we see this as an important adjunct um, and really addition, if not the, the future vision for what hospital care is going to look like in the United States and that we need to scale this. Um, to the other parts of the United States. Um, and so the, the investment that we're making is really commensurate with that sort of feeling and, and belief um, is that we, we need to move that forward. I also see a question about, are we concerned about staffing shortages? Um, and, you know, of course, during the course of the pandemic, all of us were facing staffing shortages. Um, fortunately, with the waning of what we're seeing in terms of the current activity of the pandemic, um, some of those staffing shortages have been obviated. Um, and I, what I was referencing earlier in my comments is that I think the type of staff that are going to be going into home are going to look different than your traditional hospital staff. Um, and so uh, part of the, the test of change here with this model is to look at additional practitioners that are going to participate in hospital care, whether that's community paramedics, um, whether it is other forms of nursing uh, or physician assistants, all of those actually are going to be members of this multidisciplinary team. I would like to add one more quick point, uh, which I didn't mention earlier, and it's a term that many don't necessarily like or dislike, but it's the term, it's called tethering, and the, the principal idea was actually developed in a larger scale measure by the military. You have a, a lower level clinician in the field, like a paramedic tethered to connected to a command center where the clinical expertise resides, partnered with as a team, the two clinicians, the one in the field and the one in the command center deliver the care as partners on behalf of the, the decentralized care model. Uh, medics have been doing that in the field with, with soldiers for, for decades. But the basic principle is when you compare the expertise and the technology that resides in the command center and in the field with a local clinician on the field touching the patient, you have the new model. That is the heart of the new model. We're clumsily calling it tethering. We, we're not sure that's the right name, but that's the basic principle of the decentralization of care. Centralized expertise, technology married to clinicians in the field at the patient's bedside. And just to amplify both the comments of Stephen and Raphael, this is not a business transaction. This is about a profound change in the way care is delivered in this country by bringing together extraordinary experts that are going to help Medically Home grow rapidly. I serve uh, on the advisory board and Raphael and Remy and I meet and speak quite frequently, taking my 40 years of expertise, taking Mayo's expertise, taking Kaiser's expertise to help them steer in this next phase of their growth. And similarly, growing this new, what I'll call set of care, uh, home care experts, whether those are nurse practitioner, physician assistants, or community paramedics is also part of our passion. 
and all of us will be working together in training this next generation of workforce because we agree with you. We are going to have to train novel pay people as well as upskill existing people to meet this new care model. Yeah, and I will just. I was just going to ask you to add. Go ahead. Yeah, workforce development is a long-term strategy that we are beginning to uh, embark on, and so we're starting to have those conversations with uh, learning institutions about training the workforce of the future. So, because we see this as a model that is only going to grow and help our patients in the future. All right, I think we have answered all the questions in the chat. I'll give um, journalists one more chance to take themselves off mute if you need any other questions answered or need any clarification. Yeah, if I could ask a quick one, this is Paul again. Um, I'm just wondering what physically it looks like. What is in the person's bedside? You said there's an integrated communication monitoring safety system technology in the home do you, do you bring in screens do you have um, a person that brings in uh, physical equipment please describe that if you would very very quickly in the interest of time so imagine there are four components to what goes into the home and it's set up very rapidly typically in under 40 minutes paul so it's first a communication platform that consists of a custom design iPad and, and commensurate software to interact with the patient and the family around the clock. There's something that looks like a phone, but it's actually a walkie talkie that the patient can pick up 24 seven and access their care team around the clock uh, without a dial. Uh, they pick it up, they're talking to us, we pick it up, we're talking to them. So that's on the communication side. There is a backup power, backup cell signal, backup internet connection to, to support that communication and never going down. There's a suite of integrated technologies that provides vitals monitoring, both real-time and intermittent. There's an emergency response system, and there's all of the equipment and supplies, including durable and medical equipment that's required for that patient stay at home. All of that is in a kit. It gets set up rapidly in the home, and it's, um, it's connected to the command center around the clock. Maybe just to add one comment, Raphael, is that I have colleagues in Europe who say, of course, we have broadband to every household, don't you? <laughs> and the reality, of course, as Medically Home has experienced variations in connectivity, it has had to deploy cellular modems in the home to ensure that patients have robust connectivity. Yeah, the, the, good, the good news is I've just met with a number of telecoms. They're all sharing the same future, which is smart homes for healthcare, smart factories, uh, smart transportation. So at, all of the telecoms recognize that 5G and, and its confederates are coming to help enable, you know, complex data needs in terms of in terms of patient care and monitoring of the home being on the top of the list. So we see a good future of support there as well. Oh, this is Chris. Uh, one quick thing. Uh, when do you see this? I realize it's being used in Eau Claire. Um, do you have a timeline for when Minnesota patients might see it? So our next rollout is in Arizona, uh, but certainly there are ongoing discussions in Minnesota about what is the right uh, clinical specialty to address as we are looking to expand the kinds of offerings to other clinical conditions. Thanks. So I think that um, wraps up our questions. If any journalists have follow-up questions, um, you know many of us on here, um, whether it's for Medically Home, um, Kaiser Permanente or Mayo, just please reach out to us. A reminder of that embargo lift, 12.01 a.m. Eastern, Thursday, March 13th. Thank you for abiding by that. And um, I think that will cover it. So congratulations uh, to everybody and great to have everybody on this call today. We truly appreciate your time. We know everybody's busy. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank have you. A great day.